than a pantheon of gods. Okay, this is called the ancient Near East. Okay, so you have Mesopotamia, you have uh, the Assyrians, you have the Babylonians, all that. So, and, and you have right in this area where they predict the Garden of Eden was. Amen. And so then, so Abraham has to travel up this river because he had to stay where, where there was a water source, to, you know, for his flock. Comes to Haran up in here, then when God tells him that he he says. Uh, Get out of the land of your fathers and your kin folk to a land that I will show thee of. And then this place, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to bless those who bless you. I'm going to curse those who curse you. He says, all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you. We call it the sevenfold blessing. So Abraham then travels down to this part. Now what is revolutionary about who Jesus was and what Judaism brought to us? Uh, the ancient Israelite, what they were called Hebrews, uh, because they were Hebrews because they were not yet a nation. So this is the differential when you have called them Hebrews. They call them Hebrews because they were, were uh, nomads. They traveled from one place to another. They were not called Israelites until they actually settled into the land and the monarch started. That's when they began to be called Israelites after Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. But this is very significant for you to understand. So. What made them different is that everybody else in the ancient Near East, the Samaritans, uh, the Babylonians, uh, who else, uh, the Arcadians, all these other people that these Old Testament scholars would bring up and say, oh, you got Old Testament parallels. They have some of the same stories. But, but if you read the Old Testament parallel, it's kind of crazy because for them, they believe in what they call uh, this Jewish scholar called Kaufman believed in what he called a meta divine realm that existed, and that the gods, plural, liturgies, the L's in Hebrew, were birthed out of this meta divine realm. So you had uh, the gods was a part of the natural phenomenon with nature. So you had a sea god, you had a sun god, you had a moon god, you had a wind god, you you had a fertility god, and then they also always portrayed the gods as male and female or with gender. So you had gods and you had goddesses. Okay. So yes, some of their practices were similar because this is the community in which the nation of Israel was a uh, birth out of or emerged from. So, so some of this stuff is kind of similar because they was in the same community, right? So some of the practices that the um, uh, Mesopotamians, the Arcadians, the Samaritans, the, yeah, some of this stuff is similar. However, Israel was different because they believed in a God that they could see. All right. So what they would do, they would build a shrine or a temple, and then they would get these idols, right, and which they believe was the image of their god or goddesses. And then they would go to the priests and say, you need to do a, some kind of seance or soothsays or something where you would impose the spirit of the, the, of the, the deity into the idol. And so the idol now represents their God. That's why they will carry their God everywhere they go. And they say, oh, I need to pray to my God. I sit my God down. Oh, you know, whatever they say. Because for them, they believed that invoking the favor of the God was important. It wasn't about a love relationship. They wanted the gods not to be angry with them because they feared chaos. So when they looked at the storm that came, there was a storm God. So, so, so they wanted peace and not chaos, not storm, not hurricanes, not winds, not the sea raging that tear up their ships. So they had to appease the gods. So they would sit their idol down in a shrine and then they would bring them food, they would bring them drinks because and, 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 they figured this will appease the God and as long as the God was happy with them, there won't be any droughts, their crops will prosper, their wives will have babies and life will just go on trying to minimize chaos. Y'all got that? Now, but what was different is when his Abram comes along and then God speaks to him and he's like, okay, now this is different from anything I ever known. Uh -huh. there, there is a real God because this voice is speaking to me, uh -huh. telling me to leave where I am and go to a land that he will show me. Okay, so then uh, Abraham said, okay, I'm going to obey this God. And so he, God told him to leave his father's house and from his family. Why do you think he told him? Right, 
He didn't want them, he didn't want them to try to convince him that God had not spoken to him to make him go back to bow down to rocks and bowing down to trees. But Abraham actually heard the voice of God and that this God he began to discover was not subject to nature, but this God was above nature. That this God was above his creation. And also, the gods of, of these other ancient Near East, it was not about morality to them. Their gods were amoral. So the gods didn't care if you committed adultery or not. They didn't care if you told a lie or not. They didn't care if you stole it or not. All they wanted you to do was to, do was to appease God, make the God happy, so that the God wouldn't send a windstorm or storm or make a drought come. But this God was different because this was a God about that was a moral God because in the beginning he said everything he created was good. So what Israel did that his neighbors did not do is he had this revolutionary idea that there is only one God and that this God is spirit. He is not bound by material or a material world. And that he and that he was a God of purpose because he told him to leave and that he had a purpose behind everything that's happening in Abram's life. Right? Y'all got me? So then he changed his name from Abram to Abraham because he said, you, uh, you're you going to have a son. And, and, and his, but, but the promise that God made Abram was so crazy in the fact that God was telling him that he was going to be the father of many nations, but his wife Sarai was barren. Most people don't really focus on that in the text, understanding something about God. God had it gave him a promise, and his wife was barren, but Abraham still stepped out on faith, although what was in the natural was telling him something different. This is why he was called a friend of God. And here we are in a New Testament context, postmodern society. We have the Messiah. We have the revelation of the Messiah. And we still question the promises that God gives us because we're looking at material instead of the immaterial. Because we don't understand how faith works. So he gives up this promise. This is the whole thing that took over and controlled Abram's life and Sarah's life. And throughout the whole process, though, Abraham did some things that threatened the promise. Like, like when Sarah said, oh, I can't believe you, baby, so take my slave, hey, God. And you can have a baby through her. And then, and, in other words, she was trying to help God out. But even though God knew that Abraham and Sarah was going to make it, it didn't stop the promise of God because of what happened in Genesis, when sin came into the world, God prophesied in Genesis 3.15 that the seed of a woman will reverse the curse by stepping on the head of the seed of the serpent. And this is how he's going to reverse what the devil thought he was doing. But he knew that it was going to happen by faith. Amen. Because if it's left to man, all we do is mess up God's plan, and He has to come back, and clean it up for us, and turn it back. So this is the, the so here's Abraham. I think it's in chapter 15. God comes to him in the midst, middle of the night, and he says, Abraham, Abraham. He says, Here I am, Lord. He says, You know, I shall make you a father of many nations. He says, Look up at the sky. If you can count the stars, so shall your descendants be. And Abraham is like. Wow, but Lord, and see, Abraham said, but Lord, you haven't given me a son. So my servant, Eliezer, he's going to have to take and inherit uh, my house. And God said, no, he shall not be your heir. You shall, I shall give you a son, and tonight I'm going to make my covenant with you. And so in the night season, they, they, Abraham fell into a deep sleep, and in the night season, God went through. And, but he told him, see, watch this, watch this, this is faith. He told Abraham, he said, this is what I'm going to do, so we're going to cut a covenant. So Abraham had to go get his, his choice lamb or, uh, and, and, and goat and a cow. He had to cut it in half. He had to cut some bird in half and lay it out because this is what, in that context, it meant to cut a covenant. And he had to keep shooing the buds away because he can't touch it because this is from a covenant between me and my God. And so while Abraham was sitting, God passed through the animals saying, let this happen to me or you if we do not keep the promise of this covenant between you and I. So here is God, right, condescending, coming down on man's level, using man's understanding, his language to communicate to him his promises. Oh, yeah, I ain't getting this. 
because this is from the point that Jesus, God comes down to where man is so that he might communicate with him on his level and in his language to understand the promise that God's going to make. So then he tells everybody, he says, your descendants shall go into a land and they will be in this land for 400 years. They will be in bondage, but I'm going to bring them out with great substance. Amen. Great I'm going to bring them out with great substance. And that, so uh, we get the story of the patriarchs, we get Abraham, then we get the story of Isaac, we get the story of Jacob, then Jacob has 12 sons, and then we get the story of his son Joseph, who was sold into Egypt by his brothers. Uh, he wore his coat of many colors, and the brothers were jealous and hated on him, threw him in a ditch, sold him into slavery, and then uh, all because Joseph had a dream. And so what happens is what God promised and showed in vision and dream eventually came to pass when they had to come to Egypt because there was a drought in Canaan so that God might preserve the 70 folks and turn them into a nation. So what we find out when we understand the context of which this is coming from, then God gives us promises, but there you can't fulfill the promises without going through some things. You're going to go through some stuff. Stuff is not going to look like what God said because you can only see it in the natural or what we call chronos, linear time. What we cease to fail to forget is that God is in eternity, so he is not confined to time. He's not confined to our calendar, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. He's not confined to 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. He's not confined to that because, as a matter of fact, Kairos, which is an appointed time or season, this is how it's translated in the New Testament, is when God's time intervenes into linear time when he says, now is the time for me to bless you. And see, this is something that Abraham had to learn on this journey, traveling in this barren land, having to dig wells to find water. He had to be sensitive to the leading of God. And I'm just going to point, like when Jesus met the woman at the well, and, and she was like, uh, and he said, give me a drink of water. And she said, uh, you being a Jew talking to me, I'm a Samaritan. And he, said, and he said, well, if you knew who was asking you, you'd be asking me for a drink. And she was like, hold up, wait a minute, because she's out in the natural, but you don't have a bucket to, to, to draw with. And then he said, well, let me tell you something. She said, uh, go call your husband. Uh, she said, well, uh, uh, um, he said, yeah, you, you have five husbands, and the one you're living with now, he ain't your husband. Uh, and she said, oh, I perceive that you are a prophet, sir. And, and she said, well, we've heard that the Messiah is going to come, and he's going to tell us everything. And then he looked at her, and he says, I who speak to you am he. And he says, he says, he says I'm going to give you this, 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 this spring of living water. Amen. She still didn't get it. And what he was telling her, he said, you, I, I'm going to make you a well and a fountain yourself that's going to spring out living water that you might never, ever thirst again. And then I think somehow she got it because she went back and went and preached Jesus and turned the whole city out as an evangelist. That's what some of these guys talk about women preaching. like, what Bible are you reading, buddy? She went back and evangelized and said, let me tell you about a man. And all whole city came to Jesus because it is one woman's ministry. And then they said to the woman, now that we've seen him for ourselves, we don't have to depend on your testimony because we have seen him for ourselves. Going back to the point of digging wells, amen. See, Abraham had to learn by being lead, led by God, being led by God, that God would lead him to where he would find living water. Water is what sustains us. Water, there is no life without water. So it's metaphorically speaking, there is no life without the one true God. Amen. Amen. So, 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 so then... Uh, Joseph comes along, he dies, a uh, king, a pharaoh raises us up that doesn't know Joseph, and he is looked at the Israelites, and or the Hebrews, that's what they call it at that time, he said, they are too many for us. If they, they join up with one of our enemies, we'll be crushed. So let's afflict them and, 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 and try to subdue them. And so what he did not know, the pharaoh, that he too was a plan, he was a pawn in the plan and the will of God. Because the more he afflicted them, the more they grew. And so out of that, then, we get Moses, the great lawgiver. He's killing all the firstborn, which is all is pre-setting us up for Christ, because remember when Jesus was born? What was Herod doing? Trying to get all the boy babies. 
He was killing all the babies that the boys were two years and younger, trying to stop the Messiah, the deliverer, from coming. In other words, trying to stop scripture from being fulfilled. This ought to be a great lesson for us. Somebody ought to shop here because no matter what the devil does, he cannot stop a storm.